All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is the second video. I'm going to start playing the game now and show you how that works. Uh, I already started a video and I messed some things up, so I'm restarting. So I started a log file. I'm going to be stepping through the previous log and narrating it, <clears throat> so to speak. I want to cover a couple of things that I missed in the last video. Thank you to Al for pointing this out to me. The UK airbase uh, I had said it was adjacent to these C zones here, and it is. It is also adjacent to the C zone East 4 because the airbase icon is adjacent to that C zone. So that won't matter in this scenario, but it would matter. Uh, it could matter in the campaign game. Um, so thanks for pointing that out. And uh, just to clarify regarding ships, the in this case, the Russian task force, the Minsk and the Kirov, they have the Black B on their counter. That stands for big. These are capital ships. They are individual ships represented on this counter. And that big is showing their size. These are big ships. The American carriers are huge. And when a capital ship is hit, uh, it goes through a procedure to determine what happens to it. Is it damaged or does it sink? And the, the other ships are groups of ships. So it says Crested Group and Kinder Group. It doesn't say Udaloy Group, but those counters represent groups of ships of different classes, um, not just a single ship. I don't know how many they represent, uh, but I do know that the amphibs, per the designer, uh, a counter with amphibs represents between 40 and 50 amphibious assault ships for the uh, Soviets. So ship counters represent groups. Capital ship counters represent individual ships. Okay. So... The way that the game is played is it's a it's an I go you go system using operations points. In the campaign game, operations points are determined by card play, but in the small scenarios, they are determined by scenario. The Soviets always take the first action of the game using operations points to conduct it. <clears throat> to con very broad terms, to conduct an action, you pick a unit and you do something with it. Each unit costs one operation point to use in almost all cases. Um, there are some things you can do that cost two op points. Uh, you can fly groups of aircraft together, and it's one op point per aircraft. But in general, each unit that's acting costs an op point. We'll get into some exceptions as we go. So if you look on the top of this vessel module, the small scenario ops track, this is where you keep track of operations points in the... Um, in the small scenarios. The, in this scenario, Kirovs and Carriers, the Soviets begin with 10 and NATO begins with 9. There's something about this operations track that is important and is going to come into play quite, quite quickly. And that are these words here, which stand for events. Fast is an event, repair is an event that happens twice per turn, and ships is an event that happens twice per turn. Repair is pretty straightforward. When a repair event occurs, any air base or any facility on the map that has damage uh, is reduced by one uh, level of damage. It is also possible to spend operations points to try to speed up the repairs. In those cases, you sometimes have to roll for success, but when the repair event triggers, it's automatic. Um, the ship's events are the times that task forces move. You do not move task forces using operations points. They move by event. Um, and the fast event is a version of the ship's event. If you recall, I talked about how amphibs are slow, and so a slow ship inside of a convoy makes the convoy slow. Any, uh, I'm sorry, task force. Any task force that does not have a slow unit in it is considered a fast task force. So during the fast event, non-slow task forces will act, and we're going to get to that very quickly. What When those events trigger are... After the action, which causes both sides' markers to be at or below that event. So after the Soviets' first action, they're going to spend an operations point. This is what the ops track will look like. After the Soviets finish, spending, finish completing that action, then the fast event will trigger. Okay? I hope that makes sense. So, now it's to the Soviets for an action. And... Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list of possible actions. I'm going to tell you what I'm doing as I do it. So the, the Soviets are going to, when they can, move this task force into the Norwegian Sea and try to invade um, Trondheim. 
uh, NATO is going to try to stop it. The primary means that NATO has to stop that from happening are the uh, airstrikes from the American carriers. Uh, they also have submarines that they can employ to that regard, and there are uh, some strike aircraft here that the British uh, might be able to throw into the fray, but the main hitting power for the NATO forces right now are the carrier air groups. And so the Soviets would like to destroy some American carriers, you would imagine. And they have a couple different ways that they can try to do that, but none of those ways matters if the task force is not detected. Currently, no task force on the map is detected. Both sides know that they're out there somewhere, but they don't know close enough to be able to start hunting them and prosecuting combat with them. So the Soviets have um, want to try to make this the Norwegian Sea as safe as possible for their task force. And this submarine here, uh, is the Daphne, it's a fairly potent submarine. It's got four attack dice. That's as many as any submarine in the game. So the Daphne could uh, hurt the Russians to some extent. But I don't think it's as big a threat as the American carrier air are. And the, with the British air bases being out of action right now, they can't use their land-based fighters to try to interdict Russian aircraft. So this is a good time to try to find one of these carriers and send an airstrike after it when it is relatively when it is less well defended than it might be as the game develops. So that's what the Soviets are going to do for their first action. They're going to select, if you look over here, there are two maritime patrol aircraft. There's a Bear F, which has a range of three in the upper right corner, and the number one is its detection dice. So this is mainly a sub-hunting patrol aircraft, which could detect task forces. The Bear D, this is the bad boy that's out roaming around the globe trying to find American ships. It's got a range of six, so it goes far, and it rolls two dice trying to detect. So the Soviets are going to activate this aircraft, and they're going to send it out to try to detect an American task force. Uh, so, oh, sorry, I've got some log stuff that I've got to click through here. So, all right. Back it up. So the first move is from the airbase into this C zone north to north 910. That's one. And now it moves here. That's C zone two. And now it moves into east six where the task force is. Now some different things are going to happen here. Whenever an aircraft moves into a C zone where there is an enemy fighter active, there's going to be combat potentially. And that, that fighter could be a land-based fighter that is on patrol, or it could be the carrier air patrol for the aircraft carrier, for an aircraft carrier. And whenever a carrier has fighters, those fighters are flying combat air patrol. So the U.S. Task Force Ranger has fighters, got good old Tomcats, and they're flying combat air patrol. So uh, they are going to attempt to interdict this search attempt. So the bear has flown in here. The American fighters have gotten word there's a Russian aircraft out there somewhere. Go find it and shoot it down if you can. But if nothing else, get it out of here before it finds our ships. So the, the Tomcats are looking for it. This isn't Top Gun where they're like flying side by side, upside down, waving to each other. They're, they're trying to use their sensors to find this aircraft and trying to either kill it, ideally, or drive it away before it gets to find the task force. And that's what's being represented here, not just a bunch of missiles being launched, okay? And so if you have your player aids handy, if you get out the player aid, uh, the brown player aid uh, has one side that says attacks by fighters, cap, and interception. That's the player aid that's relevant here. If you... Look down on the left-hand side, there's a box that says Fighter Combat versus Maritime Patrol, and it tells you the procedures that you follow to, um, to have uh, this kind of combat. So it tells you that you take the fighter's inherent dice and you subtract two. So remember, the Tomcat is going to roll four dice in any combat uh, at a baseline. And against Maritime Patrol craft, it's modified by two, so it goes down to two a fighter will always roll at least one die against maritime patrol aircraft. And so then the player aid tells you what happens based on your results. But let's see what the results are. So the Tomcat rolls its two dice, and you see it's got a three and a nine. 
the Tomcat gets a plus two modifier, so that's a modified five and a modified 11, which doesn't matter. 10 is the highest it goes in this game. If you look again at the play rate, it tells you what happens. It says die roll plus tactical value equals kills allowed. That's irrelevant here. Uh, a nine or higher versus a plane leads to a minus one search per die. So each, uh, each roll of nine or higher that the fighters get subtracts a search die from the maritime patrol craft, and you can modify their search die down to a zero. It could be no, no way to search. Uh, the player rate talks about N10. That means natural 10. And when you roll a natural 10, you cause a step loss to the aircraft and it retreats without searching. In this case, there has been a single nine. And so this aircraft is going to roll, instead of two search dice, it's going to roll one. That's a pretty big difference. So let's see what happens on its roll. Now, what you want to refer to for detection is the blue player aid. Uh, on the side that says task forces, detection, missile attacks, and damage. And in the upper left is the section about detection of task forces. Um, and here we go. So a single search die. And I uh, put the Saratoga back. And the bear rolls a two. There's no modifier for the search die. And if you look at the chart, a die roll of one to two is no effect. So this bear has failed to detect the American carriers. And so the mission is over. It's going to return to base, uh, probably get a demotion, and it's going to be marked spent. So another action cannot be spent on that unit until it has um, until it has been refreshed. So that's really good for NATO. That's a big bonus. There is a rule about detection flights. If you fly a maritime patrol aircraft and use it to successfully detect an enemy task force, you are allowed to immediately use more operations points to launch a strike against that task force. And so if that search had been successful, the Russians would have had the option of sending their badgers out uh, and would absolutely have done that uh, on a mission to try to shoot up the American task force. But the search was unsuccessful, so they failed. Blame it on vacuum tube computers or something. Okay, so now you uh, now we're going to um, oh we're going to have to go through my log. Sorry, as I said, I've done a log before. You're going to move the uh, ops counter down to the nine, and now is where ships are going to happen. Let me clean this up a little bit over here, and so now we have the fast action. Now for this, you need to go to your rule book. Uh, Pretty, I'm pretty sure I'm right that the player aids do not have a description of the ship's action on them. If they do, I've never seen it. Um, it could be true. Uh, <laughs> don't take my word for it. I miss things all the time. Um, but where you want to go in your rule book at this point is to page 14 and 9.1.3 operations phase. This is the place in the rules where they tell you about the, the way the operations phase goes and about what the different events do. Um, so there, the ship's event is when task forces move. The fast event is more or less the ship's event for fast task forces only. The way task force movement happens is this. In each detection category, the Soviets move first, then NATO. So if there are, if both sides have task forces that are under good detection markers, the Soviet moves with its task force first, the good detected task force, and NATO moves with its good detected task force. Then any poor detected task forces move, again, Soviets moving ahead of Americans. So all Soviet good detected task forces would move, then all good NATO, all NATO good detected task forces would move, then all good poor detected Soviet task forces would move, and all good poor detected NATO task forces would move, then all undetected Soviet task forces, and then all American, uh, NATO undetected task forces. In this case, all the task forces are undetected. The Soviet task force is slow, so it's not at play here. So the undetected American task forces are going to move. The, uh, the NATO player has the choice of which one to do first. So first thing he's going to do is take task force Viking and move into East 6. Bang. So now both of these uh, carriers are within range for their air units of making air attacks into the Norwegian Sea. So that's good for, the, for NATO. Task Force Ranger is already here. Task Force Ranger could go ahead and move into the Norwegian Sea if it wanted to, 
almost certainly that would be crazy because what would happen next? Well, what would happen next would be these two Soviet subs, all of these subs and all of these subs would have a chance to take shots at that task force once it got detected. It will eventually get detected. Um, so the task force has the option. It could also move down here to East 4, but what good would that do? Then it's it, it can't reach where it needs to reach. It's got to wait for another ship's action to move into the North Sea. It's going to stay here. When a task force does not move, the task force owner may, instead of moving, conduct anti-submarine warfare. Um, and that is what we're going to do. Not because I think it's a particularly good idea, but because I want to show you how it works. The problem with conducting anti-submarine warfare is you're automatically marked with, um, with a poor detection. And if you roll any natural one or natural two in your prosecution of enemy subs, that becomes a good detection. Good detections for task forces are bad news. Um, you don't want your task force to be sitting under a good detection marker. Um, but we're going to see how that goes right here and right now. So how does a task force prosecute uh, anti-submarine warfare? You want to go back to your player aid, the blue player aid. And on the side, that says attacks on and by submarines. So the upper left, it shows anti-submarine warfare, and it shows the effect of different die rolls. Um, the, uh, but how do you determine the number of dice to roll? You do that if you go down one section on the player aid. It says anti-submarine warfare by task forces, and it tells you what to do. You first total your anti-submarine warfare value. And so I'm sorry, I'm going to move the ops track out of the way. So for this task force, and again, the instructions are on the player aid, how you come up with these numbers. The anti-submarine warfare value of a unit is the lower right number with the white, white background inside the black circle. If there's a submarine attached to the task force, you multiply its ASW value by three. So the Sturgeon provides nine points. The US-7 provides four, and the US-1 provides three. So we have nine plus four plus three is 16 total ASW points. It also indicates on the player aid that if you have a carrier present and it is not bad weather, you add two. So we have a total of 18 anti-submarine warfare points. I'm not gonna roll 18 dice. Next step down on the player aid, it shows you the task force ASW total and the dice and tactical modifier that you get in that case. So with 18 or more anti-submarine points, uh, your task, and that's the most, that's the highest uh, category, your task force is going to roll four die, four dice, and each dice is going to be modified with plus one. Um, it says, if you're looking at the player, it says up one row if task force is fast. Ignore that for now. That does not apply to task forces that are prosecuting anti-submarine warfare. It, it applies to task forces that are defending themselves from attacks by submarines. That's another procedure that we'll go into later. So for now, the uh, task force ranger is going to launch and uh, is going to make an attempt to search for and destroy any submarines they find. So again, this isn't DOS boot. This this uh, this Russian tango isn't sitting there like a periscope range, getting ready to shoot a torpedo. The task force is using its anti-submarine warfare assets to find any submarines that might be out there, and it's going to prosecute any contacts it finds. Will it be successful? We don't really know. So the way they're going to prosecute this is by rolling four dice and modifying each die by one. And remember, they're going to be automatically poorly detected when this is over, and they could become good detected. And... Um, that was a mistake that I made in my log. It's one of the reasons that I um, had to reset because, uh, yeah, sorry, there's another mistake I made. So here are the dice rolls, right? The, the Soviets go back. They are not a fast task force. They are not acting. Uh, and so there is uh, one roll of one and 10, not good for the Americans, and another roll of one and 10. So what does that mean? The task force is automatically marked poorly detected for conducting anti-submarine warfare. Having been so marked, if it rolls a natural one or a natural two, that detection is upgraded to good. So this was a bad decision. If I were actually playing this game, I would not have done this. Um, but we did it. So the good news for the Americans is that they have two natural tens, which is always a hit against a submarine. Uh, for the Tango, uh, any modified 10 
would be a hit. So a nine would have also killed it. So the tango is going to suffer one hit right there and go to its backside. And then it is going to be eliminated. And so here's going to be the Russian dead pile. So, um, so we killed a, uh, we killed a tango and that's good, but we are now, um, well, well spotted. Uh, the enemy knows where we are and not much we can do about that right now. Um, but it is, an, it is NATO action. So it's NATO ops. And so, um, what NATO now wants to do is, uh, try to, try to provide some protection for the, um, for their carriers here, but they really can't do much because they can't launch any land-based aircraft with this damage. There are some French fighters down here, but they only have, um, they only have range of one, so they can only get to East 4. So these carriers out here are probably in some trouble. And so NATO can't do anything to try to help them. So what it wants to do in that case is start to work on trying to interdict the, uh, the flow of Soviet units that are going to start swarming into the Norwegian Sea. And um, there are two subs that are here. There's a diesel Foxtrot. And there is a nuclear November. Neither of those are particularly good subs. The November is pretty noisy. Its defense is only an eight, and it only fires two dice. Um, the Foxtrot is diesel, which is make it's a little harder for a diesel sub to kill a fast task force. Um, they don't have a lot of divide, a lot of uh, dice, but there are some good subs up here coming in. So what the NATO is going to do is going to take its best submarine, that's the Los Angeles, and it's going to uh, move up here and go on patrol. What being on patrol means is that anytime a sub moves in, uh, the, this submarine has a chance, has the option to attempt to go fight it, right? Um, try to find it and kill it before it does anything else. Uh, nuclear submarines can move two sea zones and attack they can also move one C-zone and attack or attack only within the C-zone that they're in. They can also fast move three C-zones, but then they cannot attack. Um, or they can move two C-zones or one C-zone and go on patrol or go on patrol in their current C-zone. Um, so, you know, actually, I'm going to rethink this. Uh, they're going to just put that sub on patrol here behind the GIUK gap. So Russian subs can sneak through this way. They don't have to go through this C zone. So uh, I foolishly did the anti-submarine warfare. I won't double up on my mistake. I'll put the sub on patrol here. To put the submarine on patrol costs an op. There is an ops point. Now, the Soviets are set to act. And uh, after this action, you're going to, they're going to be down to the repair event. And when that happens, these airfields are going to come back online. So the Soviets still have a chance to try to send their aircraft out with limited harassment by NATO fighters. So that's probably the best thing for them to do now is to activate these badgers and send them on a strike against this car carrier, which has good detection. The Americans still have their F-14s out there. Um, that, that procedure is pretty intricate and takes some time. So I'm going to cut this video off right here. And uh, the next video that we get to, we're going to have a uh, Soviet airstrike inbound against the American carriers that are now um, well known in their location. All right. Well, uh, thanks for listening. And I'll get to the other video as soon as I can. Probably not till tomorrow at this point.